All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Jesse Steiff, and I'm the president of the Reading League Florida. We are really excited uh, to bring you tonight's session, Spelling Error Analysis, a window into the language centers of the reading and writing brain, uh, with our wonderful presenter, Dr. Jan Wasowitz. Uh, I have just a few short announcements here before we get into the content of tonight's webinar. Uh, I want to encourage everyone to keep up with the Reading League uh, on our various websites. The main way we communicate with folks is through social media. Uh, you can find us primarily on Facebook at the Reading League Florida, and we're always putting out high quality resources that are directly applicable uh, for teachers and other stakeholders. So please go ahead and follow us on Facebook if you're so inclined. Um, you can also find us at fl.thereadingleague.org. Uh, and while you're, while you're on our pages, I'll encourage everyone to consider joining us as members or, or making a donation. Your membership helps us keep the lights on and, and keep the high quality free uh, PD coming. You know, we're an all volunteer 501c3 organization here. And so this is only a labor of love that we do um, for free. And every penny from membership and from donations goes right back into the organization for things like insurance and other logistics. So our aim is always to keep all of our content free and publicly available, since we never want money to be a barrier for professional development. Uh, tonight's webinar, we've opened up the Q&A function, um, and we welcome our live participants to use the chat as well. Um, Dr. Wasowitz will be taking some questions at the end of the presentation, and I want to uh, just remind everyone to please use the Q&A only to ask questions and not to make uh, general comments since it makes it a bit more difficult uh, for us to work through all of those entries. If you want to make some comments, please go ahead and use the chat for that. All right, and lastly, it's, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Jan Wasowitz. Uh, Dr. Wasowitz has more than 40 years experience um, as a language literacy and learning specialist. Uh, she's worked with students who have language-based reading and writing and spelling difficulties in a variety of educational settings, including public schools, uh, and private practice. She's a frequent speaker at national and state and local meetings and has taught numerous undergraduate and graduate courses um, and has held faculty positions at such uh, institutions as Northwestern University and Elmhurst College. She's authored articles uh, and, and uh, uh, that appear in scholarly journals and is, in, and is the inventor of the original aerobics software. Um, she's also the author of all Spell Links products, and she's the lead moderator of the Spell Talk uh, listserv. And I'd like to encourage everyone to go and sign up for Spell Talk right after this presentation, uh, because it's a constant source of really high quality discussion on various language and literacy topics uh, from some of the most renowned researchers and, and, and teachers around the country. So, Throughout her career, she's received numerous awards and patents and, um, in recognition of her really pioneering work and her uh, contributions to the field of education and language and uh, learning and literacy. So Dr. Wasowitz, thank you so much for joining us and, and please take it away. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you for that wonderful introduction and thank you for this opportunity to speak here um, with members of the Florida branch of the Reading League, uh, but it's also wonderful to see so many people from so many different places. Uh, and shout out to uh, Patricia Buckley, who I saw in the chat feed is from Chicagoland, that Chicago is my home, home city. Um, I relocated to Naples, Florida, just a year and a half ago. And so being in Florida and having this opportunity to be part of an event with uh, the Florida branch Reading League is really exciting for me. So again, thank you, Jesse, for, for this opportunity for making all that happen. Um, I do wanna get one other piece of um, housekeeping out of the way. I do wanna disclose my financial interests. I am, um, I think Jesse said some of this, but I wanna make clear that I am the founder and CEO of Learning by Design. Learning by Design is the publisher of Spellings products and services. I do receive salary from Learning by Design and royalties based on sales of spellings, products, and services. And I do have an ownership interest in the company. Okay, and Jesse mentioned Spell Talk, and I always like to um, begin my sessions to invite you to continue the learning when we finish here today. 
Uh, Spell Talk is a free discussion group and multidisciplinary. We have, I'd like to say, educators of all stripes on there, and we do engage in some, you know, high level, interesting discussions that I think you won't find anywhere else. And it is, Spell Talk, Talk is unique in its, in its um, style and presentation. So I do hope you uh, join that. You can scan, you can search for Spell Talk, you can join. You can join now, um, anyhow, but I do hope you'll join, if not now, then after tonight's presentation. All right, um, we also have a, a spell linked professional learning community that is separate and that is a paid uh, PLC. Um, but mostly I want you to get on the free list serve and that is spell talk. So come on over and be part of the discussion. Okay, here's our agenda for today. I'm gonna begin with a definition of word study and talk about linguistic underpinnings of word level reading and spelling. So decoding words, encoding words. Um, once we have that underway, then it, uh, under ourselves, then it, it's easier to talk about doing spelling error analysis, which is what we're the, the topic for today. So we'll talk about spelling errors that are associated with specific underlying language deficits and how to do a diagnostic prescriptive assessment using spelling error analysis to tailor your intervention to the needs of, of a specific student, the specific needs of an individual student. And then finally, I'll wrap up with talking about how you can also use spelling error analysis, not only to, to plan your intervention, but to monitor progress over time. So that's our plan for today. But first things first, before we can talk about spelling error analysis, I do need to talk about spelling, um, I'm sorry, word study. I wanna say two other housekeeping things I'm looking at my notes and I did um, skip over those. One is um, I will take questions and answers at the end of the session today. However, I will also be pausing at points along the way to invite your questions specifically to, to the, the content just covered. So when I do pause, I'd like to ask you to, to keep your questions at that time limited to just the content we've just covered. Also, I'm not sure if handouts were already um, included and distributed, but you will be receiving handouts in your follow-up email. So if you don't have them for whatever reason, sit back, relax, enjoy, absorb, think. Um, don't worry about taking copious notes because you will be getting all of the, the handouts. Um, okay, now with that, first things first, I had to get that out of the way. First things first though, let's talk about word study, okay? Uh, we learn how to read and write through word study, and we continually learn to read and write new words through word study. And when I say write here, I, I do mean spell. Um, so let me give you an experience of how we continually learn to read and spell new words through word study. Here's a word that's probably new to you. It's a real word. I want you to read it out loud, decode that word. Think about what you have to do as you read it out loud. Again, you don't know it, so you can't automatically recognize it. It's not a sight word yet, it's not automatically identified. So what are some of the things you had to do? And this would be a time, I will be asking questions along the way too, and if you'd like to participate, you can answer in the Q&A feed. Um, otherwise, just you know, answer to yourself. I want you to be thinking about this, but what are some of the things you had to do in order to decode this word? So you're using the chat feed. I think I can manage that, but let's make it one or the other. So I'm going to ignore the question feed. Jesse, I'll let you monitor that. All right. So yes, you're breaking it down into syllables. You're looking for parts, letters that you recognize. You're thinking about morphology. I'm just, you know, some of the responses coming in. You're maybe you're thinking about rules, rules for how to pronounce or break or whatever your rules are. Great. So you're thinking about sounds. You're thinking about letters and you're thinking about meanings, exactly. By the way, this word is cacaraphiophobia. The first few times I, had, I read it, I had to decode, just as you did, thinking about sounds, letters, and meanings, cacaraphiophobia. And it was actually several presentations before I had automatic word recognition and I can immediately say cacaraphiophobia. Um, you got as far as probably figuring out the meaning that it means a fear of something. Fear of cacaraphia. Cacaraphiophobia is an extreme fear of failing or failure. Okay. So, however, you used your word study skills to 
read an unfamiliar word. We also use our word study skills to spell unfamiliar words. Now I'm gonna give you a word, oh, before I go on to spelling, let's stay with reading for a minute. <clears throat> Your word study skills will help you to a point. They'll help you to decode the word, yes. And, and they'll help you get some sense of the meaning of the word, just like with that uh, cacraphia phobia, you knew it was a fear of something, but they don't quite get us all the way on the comprehension piece. So here's a word I just encountered within the last year. I was reading an article about morphology and this word appeared, I never saw it before, maybe some of you had. Here's the context. Korean is an agglutinative language and therefore text used in the present study included many inflected words. All right, well, first of all, before I even went to the context, I did my, I used word study. I started to break it apart. I looked at letters, groups of letters. I looked for more morphemes. I see I-V-E at the end. I knew it was an adjective. And I thought, okay, well, glute, gluten, stick, stick, A-G, is that prefix that means to or toward. So it's an adjective describing something that sticks together. I got that far. I then went, I went, then went to the sentence. There's the sentence. That didn't help me a whole lot more, okay? So word study will get you so far. It helps you to decode a word. It helps you to get some of the meaning, but it doesn't necessarily get you all the way. You do need your upper level language skills as well, okay? Um, by the way, they never defined agglutinative in this article. This is the only time that word appeared, um, and that's the context. I did have to go to the dictionary, and it's the formation of words from morphemes. Okay, so sticking together morphemes that retain their original forms and meanings with little change during the combination process. Okay, well, I wouldn't get that from the word study, and in this case, not even from the context, um, but I was able to at least decode that word. And remember, I actually, after that one encounter with the word, I can correctly spell it and read it. It didn't take more than one encounter. All right, that was with reading. With spelling, we also use our word study skills to spell words. So if I ask you right now to spell the word correspondence, go ahead and spell it. Type it in the chat feed if you'd like. Correspondence. Okay. All right, so Tori, how did you know I meant that correspondence? Kimberly, okay. Ah, well, I said correspondence, Erica. Correspondence. Okay. So yeah, you would have to know the, the, the meaning because this is a homophone. <laughs> no, you don't need spell check. Um, oh, did spell check correct you? Okay. Correspondence, I would need to tell you whether I was talking about um, something that um, communicates, right? So the first spelling of correspondence or multiple people who correspond and communicate with one another. So you would have to know meaning. And of course you heard the sounds and you could put letters with those sounds. And that's all word study knowledge and skills. All right, and just one more fun example. Um, if I ask you to spell the word diapodus, I'm gonna give you an unfamiliar word now, diapodus, diapodus. Anyone wanna try any brave souls there? Diapodus. I don't know if I get the feed from the oven. Okay, Cyapodus. There it is. Okay, Cyapodus. All right. Well, without me telling you, most of you thought that it was an adjective and you spelled it O U S at the end, but you don't know. I didn't tell you. You do need to know the meaning to know whether it's O U S or I S or U S. No clue, right? So all you have are sounds and letters. And I see some really good spellings based on sounds and letters, but you have to have the meaning as well. A cyapodus is um, uh, a large footed creature. I, I, it describes something that has large feet. That's what it is, describing something that has large feet. All right, so you knew it's an adjective, it's gotta be O-U-S, but that still doesn't help you spell the rest. However, sounds, letters, and meanings will help you spell and decode words. You will need other resources. Sometimes in that case, here's one to say for this. Oh, big feet, right. So if I told you it meant it was describing something that has big feet, you should have been able to get the P-O-D-O-U-S based on your knowledge of morphology, sounds and letters. All right, anyhow, um, a lot of examples there, but all to show you that 
word study is a systematic way of learning, practicing, and applying, we were doing applying, your knowledge about sounds, letters, and meanings of words to read and spell words. We do this, we learn word study skills to read and spell, but we always use word study skills whenever we encounter new words. When we're talking about sounds, letters, and meanings of words, we're talking about language constructs of words. All right, sounds, letters, and meanings. Um, we know the big words, phonology, orthography, and morphology. And oftentimes uh, researchers will talk about the triple word form. So when we're talking about word level reading or spelling, decoding, and coding, triple word form refer refers to simultaneously drawing upon and coordinating our knowledge, our phonological, orthographic, and morphological knowledge and skills to read and spell words. Another fancy way of saying word study, triple word form, you might encounter that. All right, now in spell links, and when we get into spelling error analysis today, we break down the, the three pieces, triple word form, phonology, orthography, morphology, into what we call our five block model. So phonology is phonology, and of course there are many sub skills, but that stands alone. Okay, orthography. We break this down into two subcategories, orthographic knowledge, knowledge about letter patterns, spelling rules, letter sound relationships, basically what we would all call phonics. Separately, we have another category of, uh, it's called different terms in the literature, but mental orthographic images. If I say to you the word bucket, immediately in your mind's eye, you should see B-U-C-K-E-T. What you did is you activated your orthographic representation of that word, it's a very familiar word, stored away there in your long-term memory. Orthographic representation got activated. It popped into your orthographic working memory. You can visualize in your orthographic working memory a mental orthographic image of the word. So that's what we mean by MOI, also called mental orthographic images, mental orthographic representation, so many terms. But if you understand the concept, you don't have to worry about confusing the terms. All right, and then for the meanings, the morphology category, we break it down into two subcategories. Semantic vocabulary knowledge, knowing the meaning of the word, the whole word. And then morphological knowledge, understanding those letter meaning relationships, prefixes, suffixes, word roots. Right? So that's our five block model. And we're gonna be thinking about that when we do spelling error analysis. Um, okay, we talked about MOIs. Uh, I call them MOIs, it would be the say, but I'm talking about mental orthographic images. Um, the, the goal of, get, of all words, all words need to become what we call sight words, but I, I don't like that terminology. It has too much baggage. It's used the wrong way. Janine Heron, a colleague of mine, also on Spell Talk, called, has coined the term auto words. Once we develop a fully specified orthographic representation of a word in our long term memory, then it becomes an auto word. We can immediately recognize it when we see it, just like I can for cacraphophobia. And we can fluently, accurately spell that word um, when we need to write it. But we need to have those fully specified orthographic representations. We need to have MOIs, strong, robust MOIs. All right, that's the five block model. And just as a reminder down here, so on the top, you see the five block model. Um, each of the blocks then you'll see, and I know you know, there are sub skills within each of these categories. So just as an example, phonology, phonological awareness, you know, segmenting phonemes, segmenting syllables, identifying onset rhyme, all of those, there are many different subskills. And I just want to remind us all about that. We're not gonna spend time on this. Okay, so when we talk about the five block model and when we're gonna do spelling error analysis today, we're talking about multilinguistic um, word study. When we talk about the five block model and uh, or triple word form. So we're talking about multilinguistic Word study, the focus is on language. Um, I put the brain up here as in this particular image to remind us that there are many other parts of the brain involved in reading and writing. Of course there are, but at its core, reading and writing is language. So this is where we're gonna stay focused today on the five blocks um, and on the linguistic underpinnings of reading and writing. Um, the Language Literacy Network is an infographic I developed and, and put out last year. And big picture, and I'm not going to go into everything, but it's everything we know about reading and writing, right? There's upper level language skills, processes, there's lower level. And so what we're talking about here are what I put the blue box around, blue rectangle around, is your word level, word recognition, decoding, word recognition. 
And we're also talking about your word level, word production, spelling, spelling of words. So that's our focus, word level, word study, okay? Again, don't worry about all the details. This graphic, although if you'd like to have it, I can include it in the handout cycle in the follow up. I will include it in the handout cycle in the follow up email. Um, but my main purpose here is just to make sure you know we're focused on word level, lexical and sublexical units. So not just the word, but the morphemes and the syllables and non set rhymes and so on. All right. So I'm going to pause here because I've pretty much covered what I want to say briefly about word study. We're going to move into spelling error analysis in just a moment. But I'd like you to write for yourself or share in the feed something new that you learned or a new insight. Maybe you kind of knew that, but you're looking at it slightly differently now. Okay, so I'd like you to do that first, and then I'll ask you um, to take a look at number two. Thank you. Yes, I'll get the infographic out. Getting to Auto Words by Dr. Janine Heron. I believe she published that on the National Reading League site, so you can read it there. I know I love Auto Words too, Jody. That when she, um, she and I are we're part of, um, we call ourselves the Peace Next. It's um, Jan Hasbrook, Marianne Wolf, Janine Heron, Margie Gillis. Um, Anyhow, we all get together and we once a month and we talk about things. And she shared that with our group first. It was just. When I heard it, I, I just knew it was going to be golden. Okay. Yep. Five block model, auto words. Every, I cringe too when I hear sight words. Yep. Okay. It just has too much baggage. I mean, when it was first used and properly defined, and uh, I think it was Linnea Airy who might have first used it. I don't, I don't know. I can't remember for sure. It was used properly, but it's been, yeah, thank you, Linnea. Did, okay. Um, it's just been misused for too long that we just need to throw it away. So, all right, the next question I have is, I'd like you to look at the word down here. I'm not gonna read it out loud on purpose, but I would like you to identify something about triple word form, or in this case, yeah, triple word form. Something about the phonological structure. There's many pieces, but identify one thing about the phonological structure. Tell me something about the orthographic structure. And somebody already said something about the morphological. Good, C-H-R-O-N means time, right? So letter meaning relationships, good. You see CH and um, it could say CH, but here it says K. Mm -hmm. so you're thinking about the K sound, okay? You might say for phonological, you might say there are five syllables. Yep, CH does have more than one sound. So you have to be thinking about letter sound relationships, allowable spelling, okay? All right. I see some people saying Greek. Now, knowing that homology is important for us because it helps us sequence our development of, our, our, it helps us sequence instruction from linguistically more simple to linguistically more complex. It doesn't help students. There's no research that says students must know what is Greek, what is Latin, et cetera. There's no research to support that. We need to know it. Um, or you just need to know the sequence, that's all, um, and, and what, in, um, why that sequence is a, in a sequence um, and beyond where we are today that I can go into that. Uh, it has to do with orthographic and phonological shifts that occur when you start to combine more things together. All right, so um, great. You all shared some different pieces, right? A is also a um, prefix. And so it means something that is, well, ism can be a practice. It's definitely a noun suffix. C-H-R-O-N means time. A and uh, um, without time, something that is out of place in, in time. So for example, if you're watching a movie that happened you know, 100 years ago and you see a can of Dr. Pepper sitting there, that's an anachronism. All right. So the reading and writing brain, whether we're talking about word level or, or above word level, but I'm talking primarily word level, actually, I am talking just word level right now. The reading and writing brain, this reading writing circuit develops in the left hemisphere, but it only develops through instruction. We leverage the oral language mechanisms and we have to, um, we have to from there build a network. Um, go, the brain goes through what's called reorganization um, new neurons form, new neural connections form. But anyhow, the reading and writing network is 
formed here in the left hemisphere um, among the Centers for Phonology, Orthography, and Morphology. The Reading Writing Network only develops through instruction, and if it's good instruction, it develops well, and if it's not great instruction, it doesn't develop so well. So we have to make sure the instruction is the best, best practices. Um, okay. All righty, and so just wanted to remind us all of that again. Now, sometimes, unfortunately, too often, there can be a glitch in the system, all right? Now, we do know there could also be environmental factors as well, so we'll put that under the, the umbrella of glitch, but basically, there's a breakdown in the system. Maybe it's a genetic cause, maybe it's a cognitive, maybe it's a sensory, cause, maybe it's um, environmental, whatever, but there's a breakdown. The reading and writing network has not developed in the way it, it needs to develop. So we have a glitch. Um, I think I heard Marion Wolf call it that for the first time, and I just love that term. You're going to have all these terms to walk away with, but we have a glitch in the brain. Our job is to go under the hood and figure out where the glitch is, right? And I like to use the analogy of um, that check engine light on your in your car. When the check engine light comes on, you don't take your car to the mechanic and say, can you fix my check engine light? You take your car to the mechanic and you expect them to go under the hood, excuse me, go under the hood, perform a series of diagnostic tests, identify the problem, fix the problem. And when the problem is fixed, the light goes off. So we're not trying to fix the light, we're trying to fix the underlying problem. <clears throat> all right. Spelling, that all brings us to spelling error analysis because a deficit in any one of these areas of language, the five block model, and even you know, looking at subskills of the five block model, there's a deficit in any one of those areas, it will manifest as a very specific pattern of misspelling in the student's writing. Okay, so spelling becomes a window, the window, through which we can you know, go under the hood and really identify where is that problem, what do we need to fix. All right, spelling errors tell us a lot. Just make a note to yourself, What? because you, we'll come back to this later, but um, if you think about the five blocks, what does this spelling error tell us, other than we don't want to send our children to that school? We are committed to excellence. Just make a note, think about the five blocks, or even just think triple word form right now, phonology, orthography, morphology. You can even break it down there. Okay. And again, I'm not gonna give you the answers right now, but I will in a minute, <clears throat> a few minutes. What about this one? We wanna send our children to this school. Our teachers make a difference. <laughs> I'm not sure about that difference. Okay, write down again what you think Morphology, phonology, orthography. Okay. All right, so spelling errors become an, not only a window into what's going on, where the glitch, and it's usually more than one glitch, glitches are. Spelling errors are an early warning sign. You probably all know students, and this has been documented in, with research. There can be what is what we call the good, uh, good reader, poor speller. Okay, and I use quotes because good reader, when you go under and you really look at their reading skills, they're usually not a good reader. It's, it's extremely rare, and again, studies have been done to look at this, it's extremely rare to find a truly good reader who is a poor speller or someone who's a poor speller and a and strong good reader. Typically what happens is in those early grades, students can slide by if they don't have good decoding skills um, because they can guess and go, they can use context, um, context, it's, what they're reading is pretty predictable. They're reading narratives, they're reading stories. That's uh, their familiar vocabulary. They can slide by under the radar with poor decoding, and especially the kiddos who have really strong oral language skills, higher level language skills, vocabulary, they slide by. But if you see trouble with spelling in the early grades, that is your earliest warning sign that there's probably a, a glitch. And it's not it might just be showing up in their spelling right now, but it's going to interfere. It already is interfering with their reading in that they're not developing those robust orthographic representations that they're going to need 
um, and, and they're not developing the skills they're going to need for when they encounter more advanced words. Okay, so usually what we see is by the time a kiddo gets into third, fourth grade, for sure, they hit a wall. All of a sudden, they have a reading problem. If you saw the spelling problem earlier, they had a reading problem too. All right, so spelling error now, spelling is really important and a, and a good indicator, early indicator of a problem. Now, before we talk about doing spelling error analysis, which comes under the third bullet here, the third category of types of assessments we can do, let's just talk about you know, when you do what type of assessment. So you have to always, this is true for anything you're, you're assessing, but you have to think about what's your goal. Do you need a standardized measure? Do you need a standard score to qualify a student for services? If you need a standardized measure, you need to administer a standardized test. And that's not gonna be a diagnostic prescriptive test. Tests are designed with specific purposes in mind. A good standardized test is a really good test for giving you a standard score. But because it's so good there, it's not good in other areas and vice versa. So you first have to figure out what's your goal. All right, do you need an inventory? Do you need to describe descriptively, qualitatively, what a student can and can't spell? Okay. Then you do an inventory, something like a words their way inventory would be appropriate there. But do you want to get under the hood? Do you want to identify why the student can't spell something? Maybe you do the inventory and they can't spell the TCH trigraph. Why? Then you have to go one step further and you have to do a diagnostic prescriptive assessment and spelling error analysis is what will give you that information. Uh, so catch up on my slides. I, I personally, when I do, I do work with students in private practice, for a standardized, very quick, easy to give test, I do the test of written spelling, um, who is the most, Larson and Don Hamill, pro-ed. Okay. For inventory, words their way is the most ubiquitous, is the most yeah, ubiquitous inventory out there. They're freely available and you can do it. Okay. Here is a, so if you were to have a student spell these words, spell by dictation on an inventory, then this is an example, words their way um, inventory sheet where you're, you're again counting, okay? So for example, here, these are final consonants that are represented in this list of words that they're asked to spell. Well, there are seven final consonants. How many can they spell? Five out of seven, seven out of seven. And you can circle which ones they have and which ones they don't. Same thing on short vowels, there are five of them. Can they spell them? Can they not spell them? Which ones do they spell? Which ones do they not? There's nothing here that tells you why they can't spell. Now. Inventory is the words their way inventory, but I think probably any inventory um, uh, adheres to uh, the stage models, stage model of spelling development. And it's based on research back in the 1970s. We have current research that suggests the stage model isn't, doesn't hold up. I mean, yes, we see patterns of development um, over time, but in terms of instruction, it doesn't hold up as current models, which um, um, is triple word form teaching students how to bring together and integrate sounds, letters, and meanings beginning in kindergarten and going across the grade level. So connections model. Um, this is what happens when I look at the, the chat. I lost my train of thought. So I'm gonna look at the chat when I get to a pause time. Um, okay, so, so again, stage model looks at, um, looks at spelling as a sequential process. Now, I want to point out one example of how and why and where this is problematic. Um, let's just take here. So in this list of words, assume the student spelled all these words up top correctly or mostly correctly, but they misspelled their, their morphemes, basically. Their suffixes in this case. I think they're all suffixes, base words. OK, bases, roots, and suffixes. OK, so if your student mostly misspelled those words, you would say, according to the stage model, oh, they're in the derivative, it's been so long since I've, I think it's the derivative stage, right? The final stage, derivative stage. And so you would then, if you're doing the stage model, dutifully go and give morphological instruction. Well, that might be fine for some students. That might be exactly what they need. However, let's take a closer look here at some spelling errors and see if that would be true in all cases. Let's take a multimorphemic word, visible, if a student misspells visible in one of these two ways, this is indicative, and we're going to talk about this more in detail in a minute. This is indicative of a phonological awareness deficit. 
the student is still struggling and breaking down with the phonological structure of the word. That's where their instruction should begin. Here's a student who misspells visible this way. This student doesn't yet have fully developed orthographic knowledge, letter pattern spelling rules and knowledge. So you'd want to start there and move forward. A student misspells visible like this. Okay, well now that more that makes sense, morphology. Yeah, visible as an adjective suffix can only be spelled two ways, I-B-L-E, A-B-L-E. That's not one of them. So the student needs to learn the letter meaning relationship. Same thing with the root V-I, it should be V-I-S to see, right? This student absolutely needs morphological instruction. Now, what about this student who spells visible like this? Well, that's not a problem with morphology. This student hasn't developed a mental orthographic image, a robust orthographic representation of that word in their long-term memory. So that's where the this instruction would need to focus. Morphological instruction is a slow way to get there. Going in and doing tailored or targeted instruction that targets development of mental orthographic images is a much quicker way to get there. All right. So we think about it, you know, traditionally, again, stage models look at spelling development and spelling instruction as a sequential kind of linear process. So in kindergarten, students get a lot of phonological awareness instruction, then they put that aside and it's all about the orthographic knowledge, and then we'll put that aside and it's all about vocabulary by the time they get into fourth grade. Not that they weren't getting vocabulary earlier, but now you know, they've got their vocabulary units and that's the focus. And then they move on in fourth, fifth, sixth grade and it's all about morphology. Nowhere in any curriculum or intervention that I've seen to date, do I see any explicit instruction on MOI, more mental orthographic images. Now, MOIs can develop incidentally, they typically do in, in good readers. Um, not, so, not so incidentally do they develop in poor struggling readers and writers. So they do need targeted intervention. So in a multilinguistic model, which is kind of the, the antithesis of the stage model, multilinguistic, called different terms again, repertoire, overlapping waves, multilinguistic. My favorite connectionist model because um, the neuroscientists talk about developing neurofunctional connectivity of the reading writing circuit in the left hemisphere of the brain. So I like to use the term connectionist model when we're talking about the instruction that facilitates the development of neurofunctional connectivity. Triple word form theory, again, many different terms, but they're all talking about and viewing based on the last 20 years of research or so 20 ish. Um, they all view spelling development as a dynamic interplay. It's not sequential and linear, it's dynamic. So we draw upon and utilize phonological, orthographic, and morphological knowledge and awareness across grade levels. Of course, the flexibility of that use is dictated by the demands of the task and just the overall level of literacy ability. If I haven't learned about morphemes, I can't really bring that to the task, right? But, but if you teach me about morphemes, I can. So the idea is that it should be integrated, it should be all of them. Um, and depending on what I'm trying to spell and where I'm struggling, I might need to draw more upon my phonological knowledge and skill, my orthographic knowledge and skill, my morphological, but I really kind of have to be bringing them all to the, to the problem solving task of how do I read this word? How do I spell this word? All right, so we're talking now instead of isolated, skills grade by grade by grade, all integrated, five blocks, whether you're in kindergarten, whether you're in high school, um, wherever you are, and no longer is that MOI block off to the side because it's fully integrated to help facilitate this functional connectivity of the reading writing circuit. All right, quote from Daffron. Um, I'll from the references as well. Learning to spell may not proceed in development of stages or phases. This was in 2017. So again, current understanding. Um, it may not proceed in those stages or phases. An explicit instruction in phonological, orthographic, and morphological components of language is needed in middle and upper primary school years and potentially beyond. Okay. Um, the, I would others, and I would argue earlier, because you need morphology in first grade, E-D-I-N-G, those are morphemes, right? S, yes, okay. The findings of this study here, Daffron, is that um, it highlights a need for teachers to be informed of the specific linguistic skills that individuals 
um, bring to the classroom and to be able to identify instructional priorities among phonology, orthography, and morphology. All right, so that's, that talks about instruction, but of course, if we're gonna do intervention, if we wanna identify where we're gonna pinpoint our intervention, we need a diagnostic prescriptive assessment. We need to do spelling error analysis. And this is a sample of spelling from a student of mine many years ago. She was just entering fifth grade. Um, we'll look at this sample again in a few minutes. Marissa is now, she's out of graduate school. She was in graduate school three or four years ago. So I'm sure she's out, but I am not a good speller. She had a lot of issues going on. We'll talk about her spelling sample. But diagnostic prescriptive assessment, I, I mean, I didn't. We could give her a standardized measure, but I could tell she's got a spelling problem, right? Um, inventory isn't going to help me because it doesn't help me know what type of instruction to provide. All right, so a deficit in any one of these language areas, skills, sub-skills, will manifest as specific patterns of spelling. Spelling is the window um, into the brain, really, the linguistic brain. So using speller, spelling error analysis to identify which linguistic deficit are interfering with spelling and word level reading. And this, um, if we use those spelling error analysis, this prescriptive approach will lead us to very specific goals and activities that allow us or help us to improve spelling and word level reading to really give some targeted instruction. So take a look here, and this would be a good time um, to, to chat if you'd like, but I'd like you to think about what types of Errors are you seeing here? There's lots of them. Take your pick. Wait, people like their chat feeds. Nothing in the questions. Okay. Hasn't learned DGE. That's true, but that would be an inventory type of response. What's the problem? What am I going to do about that? What type of instruction does she need? Right, phonological errors in the word republic. She's not representing every phoneme with a letter and the sequence of letters does not align or correspond to the sequence of phonemes. Mm -hmm. Yes, she has, yes, Jenny, she has phonological, orthographic and morphological deficits. Yep. And yes, I know Erica, of course, you're still learning and it's just to kind of get you thinking, don't worry. I've been doing spelling error analysis for 22 years now. I was thanking Jesse uh, before we came live because I haven't had a chance recently to talk about spelling error analysis and I miss talking about it because it's uh, word nerd alert, but it's a passion and not, it's almost a hobby of mine. Um, I still get stumped every so often and you are, this is new to you, give yourself lots of time, practice, practice, practice. All right, but this is to kind of get you thinking here. Um, you guys have already pointed out, <laughs> yes, it's all new. Here's one, so someone already pointed out, the public is, showing a couple of phonological errors there. Okay, yes, unfortunately, many teachers would say that these kids are still learning and spelling is not an issue. Well, I would ask them, well, are you concerned about reading? Because if you're concerned about reading, spelling is an issue for sure. All right, does it make, um, it does make you look at words in a new way. Good, here's another error. So someone mentioned, I think the DGE, okay. This is an orthographic knowledge error. Well, there's actually two of them going on here. Eh, so short vowel eh sound in a closed syllable. And by closed, I mean a spoken closed syllable. It closes with one or more consonant sounds, not letters. Um, eh is almost always spelled with the letter E. So this person does not have or is not applying that orthographic rule. Just at the end of a one syllable word with a short vowel sound is always spelled DGE. So again, orthographic knowledge and rule. Um, Semantic awareness and, and maybe just she hasn't um, fully connected, functionally connected the orthographic representation of the word with the semantic representation. I'm sure she knows the difference in meaning between two, number and two, okay? In fact, she had pretty good language, oral language, but she either hasn't fully connected the orthographic representation with the meaning um, or she just wasn't thinking and paying attention, being aware, semantically aware of the meaning when she selected an orthographic representation. Here's a morphological knowledge error, ENS, at the end of a noun, allegiance, the noun. ENS is only spelled two ways, E-N-C-E-A-N-C-E. This is not one of those ways, and there might even be some 
uh, or the uh, phonological deficit at play there as well. And here's an example of a morphological, uh, I'm sorry, an MOI deficit. American, whenever any vowel um, is followed, followed in that same syllable, uh, so the post-vocalic consonant is R, L, N, G, the mm sound. Whenever that happens, the vowel is distorted. We, we can't reliably identify what that vowel sound is. So we need to rely on a robust mental orthographic image to correctly spell um, that part of the word. So this is a, an example of an MOI error. Okay, this is another student. I know this is hard to read. I so wish I had a better um, example, but this was a student in grade six. Marissa was in grade five. I don't know why I was having them write a Pledge of Allegiance. I think it was because I figured they knew it. I always have them do this on my first session. They know it, it's familiar, just write it, okay? okay. Kayla shows a completely different error pattern. And because it's hard to read, I'm, I'm just gonna tell you, all of her errors are morphological, okay? With one exception, which is, oh, here, just point out a few of them. She wrote which for which it, for which it stands, which she spelled it W-H-I-T-H. So although she, yeah, she's T-H, she might have a, what we would call a faulty phonological representation of that word in that she's probably memorized, right? She's all memorized the Pledge of Allegiance. And somewhere along the line in her mind, it was for with it stands. And she might have been confusing that. Kind of like when I was a child, I thought elemento, the word mento was in the middle of APCs, elemento P. So um, sometimes we just have a faulty phonological representation and that can affect our spelling. But otherwise, she had only morphological knowledge deficits. So it really you know, gives you that insight into where does instruction need to focus. Uh, intervention, we're really, you're doing spelling error analysis. You're really looking at a kiddo who has deficit of some, you know, of some degree, they don't necessarily have to be so severe they're in special ed already, but tier two, tier three, we can get them and, and remediate. All right, so now let's look at some very specific examples of deficits that are spelling errors that fall within each of these five block buckets, if you will, five blocks. All right, so if a student has a phonological awareness deficit, here are some common types of spelling errors you can expect to see. Omissions of letters for less salient phonemes, especially in what's called the internal location. So um, st, the, the cluster, the, the constant cluster there, the t is on the inside, right? It's not on the outside um, of the word. And so that's called the internal. Um, and also, then also for vowels in unstressed syllables. We, typically, if there's a phonological deficit, phonological awareness deficit at play, you see omission of letters for less salient phonemes, and especially um, in internal locations of these clusters and in unstressed syllables, there are just some examples. Okay. Um, that's very common, right? We've all seen that. Less common, but what, where I see them, these errors, additions of letters for phonemes that are not in that word, I see these in my more involved students. Marissa, very, you know, it's, classic dyslexic, severely dyslexic student. This is where I typically will see more additions of letters or phonemes that are not in the phonological structure of the word. The word is meth, I meth, I meth, store. Okay, they're picking up on the nasal quality of a vowel, the vocalic quality. They're inserting a, an N there, letter N. That's not the phonological structure. All right, letter reversals, especially for liquids and nasals. Um, so the word fold, spelled F-L-O-D, okay, best spelled the way you see it. What's really happening, what is happening here, when you see these words where all the letters are there, right, all the correct letters are there just out of sequence, this student has what we call a fuzzy MOI. They've, they've started to develop their orthographic representation of the word fold or best. It's fuzzy, it's not fully developed, and fuzzy is the word the researchers use. Um, but, and they're over relying on it. It's fuzzy, it's there. They activate it in their orthographic working memory and they just put down these letters that they think they, they see. If they were not over relying on a fuzzy MOI and instead paying attention to the phonological structure of the word, they would put the letters in the same order as the phonological structure, the phonemes, right? So this isn't necessarily a phonological um, deficit. It's more of a phonological awareness, thinking about 
the, the phonological structure of the word and bringing that phonological awareness to the task of spelling and really silence, si silencing the over-reliance on mental orthographic images. Um, spelling the same, the same spelling of two different phonemes. So um, the word bet and bit, those two words are both spelled as bet. We see these vowel confusions, especially short vowel confusions a lot. What's happening here is the students are not yet um, recognizing the difference between e, eh, i, eh. There's a little bit of a vowel discrim, vowel identification deficit, the phonological deficit at play. We need to address that because you can't hang a letter onto a sound until you first have two, you know, if you have one sound, if e eh and i eh sound the same to your student, how are they gonna put two different letters, right? E eh and i eh first have to be recognized as two different phonemes, and then they can hang some letters on them. Okay, and then, um, this is common, phonetic spellings of the unstressed vowel sound, rocket sounds with an IT. Now, again, not a phonological deficit per se. They certainly are recognizing that there's a, a vowel in that second syllable, but they're over relying on spelling by sound. They hear rocket, it, it, and they have not become phonologically aware of stressed and unstressed syllables and what they need to do if they are spelling a vowel sound in a stressed syllable, they can use spelling by sound, going from the sound to the letters. If it's an unstressed syllable, they're not gonna correctly spell that, almost always not gonna correctly spell the vowel phoneme if they rely on spelling by sound. They need to bring in other strategies, typically morphological, oftentimes in a base word like this, their MOI strategy. But until they can first be aware of syllabic stress, they can't go to the next step. Okay. All right, orthographic knowledge deficits. Um, if there are deficits here, you will typically see what are called illegal substitutions. Okay. Catch is spelled C-A-S, illegal. We never spell ch in the English language with the letter S, illegal. So that would be right. So letter sound relationship knowledge, right? Not an allowable spelling. Same thing, not just for individual phonemes, but for phoneme um, combos. So crook, that combination of two phonemes, crook, is always spelled with letters CR, unless you're going to Krispy Kreme. Um, drook, that combination of sounds, yeah, it kind of does sound like a J, but that combination drook is always spelled with DR. So now we're talking about letter sound relationships, but at the level of a combination of phonemes to a combination of letters. Um, Students who misspell with what's called phone of phonetically possible spellings that violate rules. Rain, spelled R-A-N. Hmm, well, okay, I hear a long vowel A sound and long vowel A can be spelled with the letter A. Of course it can be, like in table, but the, in a speech to print, and I'm not even talking about speech to print today, but those of you who follow me know that I advocate strongly for speech to print instruction. Um, in a speech to print approach, we would teach our students, well, listen up. If you hear, identify a long vowel sound in a closed spoken syllable, so when you say it, it ends with one or more constant sounds, rain, the rule, the orthographic rule, is that you always need two vowel letters to correctly spell that word. Okay? Coach, same thing. Um, if you hear ch at the end of a um, syllable that has the long O sound, it's never spelled. TCH, it's always spelled CH. Okay. Um, and some of these rules, many rules apply just to base words. Other rules are going to apply to the joining of uh, morphemes. All right, violation of word position constraints. These are less common, but again, you'll see them in your more involved um, impaired students. So violation of word position rules, basically, basically rules and patterns. So just fudge spelled F-U-J. Well, just is very oftentimes spelled with the letter J never at the end of a word. Same thing for chop with TCH at the beginning of the word. All right, all of those were examples, not an exhaustive list, but of the more common ones that you'll see when there was orthographic knowledge deficit. Semantics. Of course, word meaning. Um, word meaning comes into play a couple of ways, a couple of places. First of all, um, misspelling of WH words, when, where, why. Uh, you could teach a student an orthographic rule, the w, sound, again, speech to print, the woof sound is always spelled with the letters WH, 
in a question word, but how does the student know what a question word is? That gets back to understanding the meanings of words, semantics. So you have to first make sure they understand the semantic concept before you can teach the orthographic rule, okay? So you would do that in the case of this type of misspelling. All right, well, that only covers five words. Um, more more uh, global, if you will, is the, um, the role of semantics word meaning in homophones, spelling homophones correctly. So again, in order to spell a homophone correctly, we had this with uh, Marissa, where she spelled choo-choo incorrectly. Um, yes, you do have to develop a robust MOI, orthographic representation, orthographic representation of the word, and you have to functionally connect, integrate that orthographic representation with the correct meaning of the word. And unless you do that, you're going to have homophone confusion. Maybe you've done that, but maybe you're not monitoring, you're not being semantically aware as you write your words and you just randomly put one in there instead of the other. So um, semantics uh, in terms of word study really comes into play uh, again, with these homophones, and there are quite a few, and we oftentimes see these in errors, very commonly see um, them in error. And I would argue um, in part because they rely on strong MOIs and, and unless you explicitly teach and develop MOIs, they're not coming on their own um, with our struggling students. All right, morphological knowledge deficit. You're gonna see a whole different set of spelling errors for morphological knowledge deficit. You'll see potentially the omission of a morpheme. So a student who spells walked without the suffix. Okay, it's possible this is a phonological deficit, right? The k -t -cl consonant combination at the end of the word, that's a pretty tricky one to separate. So you would have to tease that out, but assuming once you, you know, kind of did some probing and you identified, well, yeah, they, they recognize that there's four phonemes in the word, w -a -k but they just don't put a, uh, 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 any letters. Well, they're not thinking, first of all, they're just not thinking about, you have to have a letter for every sound, uh, at least one letter. But in this case, they're not thinking about past tense and, and the, the letters that you would use to, to mark. You have to mark the word for past tense. Okay, so more commonly though, I think we, what we see is phonetic spellings of morphemes, walked with the letter T for the ED inflectional suffix, musician, where they change the letter C in music to the SH, because it sounds like shh, sure does. And SH is a common spelling for shh, all right? And they aren't correctly using the, the suffix that means a person who does something. Um, all right, you may also see, um, you will also see failure to use a semantically related base word to correctly spell the inflected or derived form. So for example, uh, in an easy word, student might know how to spell music, and they might even know that music and musician, they probably do know music and musician are semantically related, derivationally related, but they're not used, they just don't, no one ever told them is what I'm learning. No one ever told them explicitly that you first start with your base, make sure you have your solid base word there and then add on your suffixes and prefixes. Um, so it's possible they have the base word spelling and they're aware of the semantic relationship, but they're not um, using the base word spelling as a strategy to then get to the uh, inflected or derived form. Oftentimes though, when you get into these more advanced words, ascend, ascension, or even busy business, because it's more um, uh, obscure, the, the relationship is the semantic relationship. We might, we have to do some morphology instruction and semantic instru you know, vocabulary instruction and explicitly teach our student how these words are instructed. What is the meaning of ascend? What is the meaning of ascension? How are they related? Um, how can we use the spelling of the base to spell the related word ascension? So this all becomes part of morphological instruction when you see these types of errors. And then you do have to kind of figure out, well, where's the breakdown? Do they know it, but they're not using it? Or do they just not have that knowledge and skill? And whenever we start to add more themes together, of course, rules come into play. Some people might call these orthographic rules. In spellings, we call them morphological rules because they specifically apply, there, there's a set of rules that specifically apply only to the addition of suffixes and prefixes. And so we just put that under morphological knowledge. Okay. All right, mental orthographic images, Legal spellings. We talked earlier about illegal spellings. All right, head is misspelled H-E-D. Oh, that is so legal. We almost always spell the S 
sound with the letter E. What a smart student you are. Okay. In this particular word, we spell it with the letters E-A. Rope. Oh, yep. O can be spelled O-A. Sure it can, just like in soap. But in this word, we spell it O-P-E. Um, city, because that's a flap sound, duh, slapped in the middle of the word city. Um, sure, we could spell the flap duh, sound with D, 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 T, T, T. Um, and the only way you're going to need, the only way you'll remember the correct spelling in this word is by having a robust orthographic representation. And MOIs are word specific. So you develop an orthographic representation for the word head and rope. You develop them for every word. But when you get into these um, unpredictable spellings, right, then you're going to need more interactions, more instruction, different types of interactions with the words to develop those robust orthographic representations. Because remember, all words have to become auto words, but these words are going to need extra attention to become auto words because of these, these spellings are not predicted based, about, based on the phonological, orthographic, and morphological structure of the word. There's nothing there to predict the correct spelling. We also do develop MOIs for parts of words like rhymes as well, um, but they are word or rhyme specific. Uh, oh, we also develop them for morphemes, uh, prefixes, suffixes. All right, now another type of error you will see in a student who has uh, MOI deficit is misspelling of unstressed vowels, okay. bucket. They're spelling it the way it sounds. They haven't developed an orthographic representation. There's nothing that's gonna help them correctly spell these misspelled parts. Phonological, orthographic, morphological, ain't gonna get you there. So you're left with orthographic representation, a robust mental orthographic image. Okay, I mentioned this earlier. Whenever a vowel sound is followed by these consonant sounds, we don't know what that vowel is. Okay. Some people say sang. Some people, if I had time, took a poll. Some of you would say that's a long vowel A sound. Some of you would say it's a short vowel A sound. And some of you would say it's a short vowel E sound. I swear to God, I've done this in rooms. And that linguists have debated this for centuries. They don't know. We don't know. So oftentimes these are taught as rhymes because you can't identify the vowel sound, but ang is always spelled A-N-G. Okay. You're developing a mental orthographic representation for a rhyme. Remember I said you can have an MOR for the whole word and you do have an MOI for the whole word, but you also develop MOIs for ang. So if you hear ang in a word you don't know, um, if I said zang, you would be able to spell it because you would have an MOI for ang. Okay, right, and, and then you bring in dialects. So meal, you know, you get into some dialects and they say it all different ways. So you just have to go from sound to letter, but now you're talking about a group of sounds. Okay? It's not a single sound, it's a group of sounds, but we, we develop an MOI for that. Okay, um, and again, those homophone confusions, I've talked about those already. At the end of the day, strong orthographic representation connected with the meaning of the word. All right, so now here we go back to these slides. What are some, oops, I'm just checking in. We should be doing okay on time. But I might pick up the pace just a little bit here. All right, so what do we think is going on here? We are committed to excellence. We'll just keep it simple, triple word form. It's a phonological, orthographic, or morphological error. And you all know this, we would never, prescribe treatment and do treatment based on a single word, but it's awfully fun to talk about individual misspelled words and very good for teaching. All right. This would be an MO, I'm sorry, a morphological error. Ents, they're representing all the sounds, right? And we can spell ents that way, like in the word dense, but yes, it's morphological. The suffix, the noun suffix, ents can only be spelled two ways. You need to know your letter meaning relationships to spell it correctly. Okay, but here they did spell ENCE with one of the two ways, right? A-N-C-E or E-N-C-E. In this case, what would it be? Yes. Good job, Rachel, Margaret. Yep, it's an M-O-I error. They have to, for this word, the word difference, they need to develop a robust orthographic representation to know that it's going to be an A and it's not going to be an E. Okay. Literacy night, oh my. 
Phonological, orthographic, or morphological? Yes, Margaret. Phonological. They don't seem to be identifying, recognizing, maybe discriminating e eh and i. Eh. So we have to start there. It's also possible if eh, they're recognizing it and not putting the correct letter, but more than likely they haven't yet um, fully discriminated and recognized those two phonemes, short vowel at eh and it eh, as two separate phonemes. Okay. And bring on the text test. We accept the challenge. Phonological, no, because they're representing every sound in the word with at least one letter. Orthographic, no, because you can represent those sounds with those letters. Morphological, to the, the prefix AC, to take, to take, accept. Okay, so morphological. Last one, I think, last one of these signs. Um, symphony is going to be on May 6th. We missed it. No school, October 31st, Staff Development Day. I hope they're doing some spelling work that day. Okay, so how about school? Let's do school first. School is M-O-I. Yep, you can spell K with the letter C and before the letter O, you, you usually spell it with the letter C, but in this word, it's spelled C-H. All right, Development Day. You think they ran out of letters? Yeah, they probably did. Okay. But play along with me. Yes, development day is phonological. Okay. However, we would see these errors in our students. You know we would. All right, this is a sample of writing from my student, Will, who's in eighth grade. He actually did a nice job writing a summary of an article he wrote. Um, but I, I wanted to put this in for two reasons. One, first of all, here's a uh, misspelled word. So let's first talk about what, what type of error. Um, phonological? No, they're represent he's representing every sound in that word, every phoneme in that word with at least one letter. And this is how I take my students through it. Have, let's think about the sounds. Have you represented every sound with at least one letter? Mm -hmm. Let's think about those letters. Are those allowable ways to spell those sounds? Well, yeah, if you go phoneme by phoneme, right? Mm -hmm. O, Z, sure. Is there anything about the meaning of the word that can help you spell this word correctly? Nope. It's an MOI. O's. Actually, O's. Yeah, well, no, no, it's actually the letter sound relationship for that rhyme, right? Because O's is only spelled O S E or O Z E. So he hasn't learned those allowable spellings for the rhymes. That would be orthographic in that case. Okay. Each phoneme is orthographically legal, is orthographically legally spelled, but the rhyme unit is not. So I would put that under orthographic. Now, the other reason I included this is you see he underlined the word. This is something I have all my students do when they, you know, once we've done a lot of spelling work um, and, and they're coming along and they're starting to write sentences or paragraphs. And I'll say, okay, I expect you to use all your spelling strategies and spell those words correctly. However, if there's a word you think is misspelled and you're not sure how to spell it, at least underline it because that tells me you're, you're checking your work and you're paying attention and you're thinking about how to spell these words. So that's why you see it underlined. Now, he does have a few other misspellings. That's the only one he underlined, um, but they're on less, they're, they're on more, what you call more sophisticated words, interim, um, which I wouldn't hold him responsible for at this point. Although internim, I think I would because that's a phonological error interim. Um, authorities, he did change. We were happy to see this because we had been working on change Y to I, and yes rule. So, all right. So in the description for this course, I invited everyone to bring your own spelling errors. This is the time. Go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, I can only do one. I, Jesse, I hope you're following along and curating away. Good. All right. So um, if you want to put some misspelled words in the feed, I will try to take a few of them. And Dr. Wasowitz, if you can, for the folks who will be listening to this um, after after the fact, they won't be able to see the chat. So if you can uh, just say out loud how the errors were spelled, and, and then and, and then talk about it. I will. I also I need to write them on the screen. Um, if you Perfect. Put my pen, and I'm not seeing my. Where's my writing tool? OK, 
I, I guess I won't be writing them on the screen. Okay, well, you all can see in the, the chat. So let's just look there. Uh, the last one I see is friend. Well, oh, okay, it's gonna go away. Friend is spelled correctly, <laughs> right? Looks correct to me. I have to put my reading glasses on. All right, brother, spelled B-R-U-D-R, -R, brother. Okay, first of all, you have to take each error one at a time. Brother, uh, uh, actually, please don't type. Write it down, brother, okay. So they spelled the uh sound, which is a stressed vowel. You can hear the true vowel sound. They spelled it with the letter U. Yay, I would say to my student, you played by the rules. Uh is usually spelled with the letter U. That would be a MLI error. Er, they spelled with just the letter R instead of E-R. That would be an orthographic violation. We don't spell er with just the letter R. It has to have a vowel letter, at least one vowel letter and the letter R. Alrighty. Oh, here's one, I'm gonna take this Oh, well, I'm going to take different because it comes up a lot. Different is spelled D-E-F-R-E-N-T. All right, there's two, there's a couple of misspellings in here. Let's go with the first one. Different, D-E-F-R-E-N-T. They're spelling the I, short vowel I sound in a stressed syllable. You can hear I, they're spelling it with the letter E. Vowel, um, vowel discrim phonologic. That's where I would go. Some of these you'll have to tease out and probe further, but this is my first working hypothesis. All right. The suffix is spelled fine, E-N-T, so there's nothing morphological there. All right, er, that's again phonological. They use just the letter R instead of E-R. That's again phonological. Um, however, <laughs> this also could be a, what we call, again, a faulty phonological representation. What I would say to my students is, you know what, sometimes we talk fast and we get sloppy and we just say words not the way they were originally created. So I say it too, I say different, different, right? So here's a student who is pretty much, except for that letter E for the I, who's spelling different and following all the orthography and morphology and doing a pretty good job. So what I would need to do, you can do a couple of things. Um, I would first uh, help them understand the correct pronunciation, different, show them the spelling, have them look at the three vowel chunks, different. But I would also then, at the same time, be talking about the base word differ. And then of course we have the suffix so that they can make that morphological connection and they can build on the base. I'm gonna spell differ and then I'm gonna write different. So it's kind of a lot, you know, again, this gets into that connectionist model. It's a dynamic interplay of phonology, orthography, morphology. Um, our instruction needs to be that way because our students need to be uh, orchestrate. We, we orchestrate, we're the conductor, but their brains need to be orchestrating it as well. Um, proud, P-E-R, this is so common, I agree with you. P-E-R-O-U-D for proud, P-E-R. So they're basically for the pr, pr, they're doing P-E-R, per. All right. So oftentimes you'll see this when kiddos are, you know, overemphasizing their pronunciation. They're, spelling, they're sounding out per out. All right. So we have to call their attention. It is phonological. I would first say to them, depending on where they are in, in my instruction with them, but proud, how many beats? One beat. Okay. Well, you can only have one vowel, that's one vowel chunk. You can only have one group of vowel letters in that word. How many vowel letter chunks do you have? Well, we've got you. Oh, well, there's a problem. All right, well, let's think about, let's listen up again. Pr, pr, am I saying per or am I saying pr, pr, okay? We wanna help them say it correctly. We, we as teachers oftentimes will model the incorrect pronunciation. If we're saying per, they're saying per, it's pr, pr, okay? It's hard, I understand. Um, and again, you show them the word, talk about everything, the vowels, the syllables, um, the pr versus per and help them with all pieces. But I would say it, it's phonological. Um, all right, I wanna move on. I could always do more of these. I could do these until the cows come home again, word nerd alert. Let me go on and try to get through most of the material and then take questions um, and more of these at the end if you want. Oh, and you're, now you're giving me the whole roses are red, diamonds are blue. There's a lot of misspellings in there. Okay, so moving on. Um, and here's where I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna stop here. I mean, I'm gonna skip this. Um, some more mistakes. You guys have plenty of your own, so I will entertain yours at the end and spend more time here. 
I'll talk about one of them here and I'll, I'm giving you the answer key so you can write down the answers. Um, Jesse, pick a number, any number at all. One through eight. Five. Five. Okay, so let's talk about number five. Convenient, convenient. So is it a phonological, orthographic, or morphological, or MOI error? MOI is kind of like after you've exhausted everything else. All right, well, again, this is how I would say it to my student. My student misspelled that word. I would say, hmm, do you have a letter, at least one letter for every sound coming out of your mouth? Convenient. Okay. Um, and they don't seem to be showing any vowel discrim errors. So I would go on and say, okay. Um, and the reason I say they don't seem to be showing any vowel discrim errors is because the, the vowel sound E and that second syllable is oftentimes spelled with the letter I in the middle of a word. So then I would say, well, are all those letters allowable ways to spell those sounds? And they'll be looking again, convenient. Yep, mm -hmm. I can spell those letters, those sounds with those letters. Okay, great. Is there anything about the meaning of this word? Maybe the, the prefix, the suffix, the base word that can help you spell this word correctly? Convenient. Okay. Probably not. Depends on where they are. Again, well, we could go to convene as a base word, and we could talk about convene and then go to convenient. It depends where my student is. If my student's in third grade, I'm probably not going there. Um, I might have to go directly to an MLI at this point. Uh, it depends where they are, where, what I'm doing, but I, I might actually introduce convene, talk about the meaning of convene, convene, and then talk about convenient and how they're related. And that once you have a solid base word spelling, then you can spell the, the relative correctly. However, um, he might still need an MOI, some MOI work on spelling even the lean part. Okay. You might want to still just spell it with, you know, E-N-E-I-N. -E so there probably would be some MOI work at some point there. All right, here are all the, oops, let's click. Here are all the answers. Um, I hope they're in your handouts. They probably aren't. I typically don't put the answer key in the handout. So if you want to grab your phones and take a quick picture, of this screen you can, but I do want to move forward. Um, all right, so doing spelling error analysis, I'm sure some of you feel like it's, you know, you're doing this kind of a problem. And when you first start out, it absolutely can feel this way. Give yourself time and grace and patience. All right, um, spelling error analysis was first uh, really talked about and, and published on by my colleagues, Ken Apple and Julie Masterson back in 2000, uh, and they wrote an article that I would recommend reading, and I'll be showing you um, some excerpts, modifications of excerpts from that. Um, and again, using spelling error analysis can help us identify which linguistic deficits are interfering with word level spelling and reading, and this prescriptive approach leads to specific goals and activities to improve spelling and reading. So they talk about this model in topics and language disorders, and um, they go through five steps. You have to have an adequate sample. We were doing one-off words. We would never, of course, make any kind of diagnose, diagnosis, prescribe treatment based on one or two words. You have to get an adequate sample. Not easy to do because there's a lot of patterns and it add up to a lot of words and it does. Then you have to identify and select those spelling patterns most frequently misspelled. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of misspelling, but where are most of their errors? Because you... You want to zero in there. The really awesome thing about doing multilinguistic connectionist model um, word study is that you are getting at the underlying language processes. Pick the patterns that are mostly misspelled, get your biggest bang for your buck because they're misspelling those patterns the most. But what they're learning as you go through the instruction on those most commonly misspelled patterns, those that level, that, that those knowledge and those skills and those underlying language processes are building up and you'll see generalization to other patterns. And that to me is one of the most rewarding parts about doing this is that that generalization is so powerful. Um, but anyhow, pick, identify and select the spelling patterns most frequently misspelled. And again, they talk about that, this, that in this article or that, this and that article. Um, and then for each of these most frequently misspelled patterns, identify, analyze the errors, and identify a hypothesis about what the underlying deficit is. 
like we were doing with the single words. But now hopefully you have many words for each pattern. And you look for the pattern, the underlying deficit. We use the five block model. We break it down even further into the sub skills within the five blocks. Again, you might have to probe a little more to find out, is it really that they can't scrim at it or do they just not have the letter sound relationship knowledge? You'll have to probe sometimes, not always. And then from there, you can write your instructional goals and you can pull, bring in the appropriate instructional activities to remediate the underlying deficit. Now, in this, um, journal article published in 2000, Topics in, La in Language Disorders, Ken and Julie present what they called at that time the Spelling Algorithm Flowchart, SAF. Um, I worked with them to develop and take the spelling analysis, spelling algorithm flowchart and all of their research up into the year 2000, their research, um, and we developed it into a spelling assessment software program. And in doing so, we made some tweaks to the SAF, the spelling algorithm flowchart that you will find in that article. Um, not a whole lot, really, but what you're seeing here and what's included in the handouts will represent the changes we made. I'm going to walk you through this quickly um, as an example of how you can take yourselves through this. And we'll keep moving forward, but you'll have the handout. The first thing you'll always ask yourself is, by the way, um, I'm going to show this to you in a couple of slides. The handout itself has this entire flowchart on one sheet of paper. It just can't all fit on the slide. All right, you'll always start by asking yourself, is the target word a base word? Stop. Is it a base word? Yes. So just follow the flowchart. Is there a phonological awareness deficit that could explain this error? Yeah, they might not be segmenting. Right. All right. So you have to probe. Can the student actually do that? You're not going to probe all segmenting. You're not going to look at their phonological awareness test scores. You're going to go in and probe specific to st clusters at the beginning of a word, because by doing that very precisely, you will know whether or not they truly can segment st clusters. They might segment other clusters just fine, although that would be rare. But you want to go in. All right. If they cannot segment phonemically, but know that there's two phonemes st, and four phonemes in the word, then you have to work on phonological awareness skills before moving on to orthography. And well, this is a base word, so morphology wouldn't come into play. What if they misspell cat as cot? Is the, is the target word a base word? Yes, meaning there's no prefix suffix. Is there a phonological awareness deficit that could explain the error? Yeah, because a and a ah is a somewhat common um, discrim error. Not as common as others, but it is. So you have to probe. If they cannot just scrim and tell the difference between ah, ah reliably, you need to work on that and establishing um, consistent phoneme identification before you can work on orthography and give them letters. And you can work on them simultaneously, but you have to make sure. And in fact, the current research, this is based again on the year 2000. The current research says you should bring them together very quickly, but you still have to be very mindful of the fact that they have a phonological awareness deficit at play. Sugar is the target word, a base word. Yes, discriminate to tell the difference between two similar phonemes and also to be able to identify them. Oh, that's a short is sound, that's a short s. So, so it's discrim first and then identify. Um, sugar, it's a base word. Is there a phonological awareness deficit that could explain there? No, they seem to be recognizing the phoneme at the beginning. Um, no, so no. Is the error legal? Can you spell sh with the letters SH? Yeah, in fact, it's almost always spelled with SH at the beginning and end of words. So you have to work on developing an MOI for that word. It's word specific. Magician, is the target word a base word? No, the target word is a multimorphemic word, base, is the pre-morpheme plus suffix, the bound morpheme. All right, is there an error on the base part? In this case, yeah. So yes, can the student, you have to go find out, can the student correctly spell the base word when it's all by itself? Maybe they can, but no, maybe they can't. Well, then you need to, if the student, you ask the student to spell magic and they spell it M-A-J-I-C, they can't even spell magic, the base word. So you're gonna have to start there before bringing in the multimorphemic word. But what if they do spell magic correctly? Yes. Well, does the student understand that magic and magician are related? Probably. But again, there's other words like ascend and ascension. So you have to first find out, do they understand the relationship? 
Well, if they don't understand the semantic relationship, you've got to really do a lot of vocab development um, and, and helping them understand the relationship there. Maybe they do, probably do under, you know that magic and magician are related. Well, then you got to teach the student, explicitly teach the student. You must first spell the base word, it must be correct. And I told my students, you are not allowed to change a single letter in that base word unless you can tell me a reason, a rule, a reason. Okay. Students have some bizarre, I've just noticed this, they have some bizarre belief that when they get to the end of a word and they're going to add a suffix, they better do something. They better change something. And they do. So I, I forbid them unless they can tell me the reason. All right. Um, one couple last examples. Um, I'm going to take something maybe a little more interesting here. Let's go with matches. Let's go with actor spelled as you see it there. Is the target word a base word? No, actor has two morphemes. Base word act, suffix er. Um, is the error on the base part? No, they're spelling the base just fine. Is the error on the inflectional or derivational unit suffix or prefix? Yeah, it is. Um, is there a phonological awareness deficit that could explain the error? No, they seem to be recognizing the phonological structure of the word. It ends with er. No, nope, I think it's fine. Is the error legal? Now you have to ask yourself, because you're talking about a morpheme, a, a round morpheme, you have to ask yourself, is it morphologically legal? It certainly is orthographically legal. You can spell er with the letters er. In fact, that's probably the most common spelling, er. I think it is. Um, but it's not morphologically legal. So the answer there is no, it's not a legal, morphologically legal spelling. You need to work on morphological knowledge. Okay. And Morphological. Hey, well, I'm going to take that back. It is morphologically legal. My bad. Because er, meaning a person who does something, can be spelled three ways E R O R and very rarely A R as in beggar. So this is legal. So now it's a development of the MOI. Okay, I misspoke there. I apologize. Um, so it's development of the MOI. If they spelled after A C T I R, that would be different. Now you have to work on morphology. Alrighty, and then of course, modification to the base word when adding suffixes. So we did develop this, again, I, I mentioned, I worked with Ken and Julie back in 2000, took their spelling algorithm flowchart. You could get that journal article, read about it. Um, we modified it slightly. You'll have it in your handouts, the flowchart. Um, we developed it into a software program, Spell2. Spell3 is scheduled for release in 2023. So I just want to mention it. Um, so you're aware of it and you'll get, oh, you'll get a set of reports. So basically everything's done by the computer. All the data collection, scoring, analysis, and report writing is done for you. So you don't have to get caught up in, in uh, I mean, I think it's important. You should know how to analyze spelling errors, but to give an example, um, just to do a level one student, I had, so the computer did the scoring and I, during development, I, I or one of my colleagues had to also do it manually so we could do a QA check, right? Is the software producing the clinical outcomes that it's supposed to? I will tell you, it took me seven hours to do the assessment on a level one and they get longer as you go along. Uh, level four, I stopped counting how many hours. Um, so there is a huge time saving benefit of using some assessment software for analysis. All right, um, quickly to show you some profiles, you'll start to see different profiles. Spell2 will give you a set of reports, as I said, you're going to get an inventory. So all the different patterns, consonants, vowels, in, uh, inflected words, derived words, inflections, derived words, un, uh, unstressed vowels, they're all there. You get your raw score. You, you essentially get an inventory. You know, long vowel E digraphs, the student got three out of 10 correct, 30%. Okay, but we still don't know why. Why is the student misspelling, in this case, long vowel E? So that's when we get into that spelling error analysis. We need to know the underlying deficits. This is an actual student, Jana, fifth grade, who's an English language learner. It's probably not gonna come as too much surprise, but in many cases, the errors are related to vowel discrimination. The error analysis tees that out, okay? A, A, vowel discrim, A, um, uh, vowel discrim. For the WH digraph, mental orthographic image, for the CK digraph, letter patterns and spelling rules, orthography. Um, for the long I, 
consonant E pattern, discrimination, again, mostly um, discrim, and then, so, oh, here, long vowel A, here it's an MLI error. He's able to discriminate, identify that vowel um, sound, but doesn't have MLIs yet developed for that, and so on. So you start to see, you'll see patterns. Again, this is a summary page. You'll also get this as part of one of the, one of the reports from the spell two, someday spell three analysis. Um, this is not uncommon. You start to see patterns. First of all, it's rare that any one student has only phonological deficits or only more MOI errors. However, you do start to see them clustering. Again, not uncommon that your ELL students are going to show a lot of phoneme discrim errors, but he has other errors as well that are going to need attention. Um, my student Claire, who was in fourth grade at the time, diagnosed with dysgraphia dyslexia, also gifted, very gifted student. She had some phoneme discrim and segmentation errors. She's in fourth grade. We had to work on those. A little bit on patterns and rules. MOI errors. So I worked with her for about two years. We cleaned up all of this. Okay, she, or, phonologically, orthographically, she's flying. MOI errors, they're always going to be the hardest to remediate. They're especially hard with kids who have attentional issues and in her case, she ain't had anxiety. And so she actually didn't, I mean, I couldn't, it was hard to get her just to engage with words. Um, and, and what do you need to do to develop MOIs? You need repeated exposures and engagements with words. Um, we did clear it up some, but I, you know, at the time her parents actually, um, uh, I'm not even sure why, but they discontinued services. I think they were getting, there was a, commuting issue. They had to bring her in for an hour. Um, anyhow, I no longer was seeing her at some point. At that point, it was all MOI errors that were remaining in terms of spelling. This is Anna, second grade, very beginning of second grader. She was identified um, as a struggling reader. No one at the school seemed to care about her spelling, but they identified her as a struggling reader. Um, beginning of second grade, she had one phoneme discrim error that we addressed and quickly cleared up. Lots of orthographic errors. Now, you know, some of this, you say, well, okay, she's just beginning second grade. These are taught in first grade, but they're revisited. These orthographic patterns are revisited in second grade. So it might not be too surprising, but um, she wasn't picking up on the pattern. I mean, these kind of patterns in a typical, typical developing reader, they do develop through implicit learning, statistical learning. She wasn't getting it. She was struggling. Um, and these are very common patterns. So uh, as it turns out, and she had a little bit of MOI, but it was really this pattern um, awareness, well, pattern development through implicit learning. And then I had to take her to an awareness level and teach her you know, at a meta level about the patterns. But patterns, learning patterns was hard for her. And interestingly, I worked with her from second through fourth grade. By the time she was in fourth grade, she was the, the best speller and reader in the class. She was fine, they, they stopped all of her extra services, but she still needed to continue speech language therapy because she was struggling with syntax patterns in spoken language. Again, patterns and rules. She was having a hard time through statistical implicit learning picking that up. And so that was just an observation anecdotal that I noticed. Difficulty with patterns and rules, implicit learning, statistical learning, her written language, also showing up in her oral language. You're gonna see different profiles of students. Here are two fifth grade Hispanic ELL students, same school, same classroom. One student, these are um, spell results, but long A sound, or long vowel sounds, A-E-I-O-U, long vowel sounds for student B, A-E-I-O-U. Um, you can't read the fine print here, but just think about the blocks. We'll look at the long vowel A for student A, he has his phonological, orthographic, semantic, morphological knowledge skills in place. He only has an MOI deficit for spelling words that have long vowel A sound. Look at his buddy over here, student B, long vowel A sound. He can segment the, phon the, the phoneme A, long vowel A. He's not able to discriminate it from other vowel sounds. He doesn't have any orthography yet, or, or he hasn't started to develop MOIs. So you start to see very different patterns, even though these students you know, have the same instruction, the same background. Uh, and that's what I love about spelling error analysis. Um, what you get back in terms of the results is your starting point. It's important to remember, you know, in this case, start with orthography. This student needs, in case of long vowel O, 
the student was able to segment and identify, reliably identify the long vowel O sound, but he doesn't yet demonstrate letter sound relationship skills, knowledge. So you would, you would begin your instruction there, orthography, letter sound relationship. You have to remember, you keep going though, because there's lots more to learn. You gotta learn patterns and rules. You'll have to develop MOIs. Um, so always think of that as your starting point and then you go forward. All right, so 